ashes and hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. Yes, He is. Come on. And I'll raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. Yeah. And I'll raise a hallelujah. And I'll watch the darkness flee. And I'll raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery. And I'll raise a hallelujah. Cause fear you lost your hold on me. Yes, it has. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. And louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up on the ashes. And hope will arise, and death is defeated. The King is alive. Yeah. And sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. We're gonna sing a little louder. Sing. Come on, we're gonna sing a little louder. Oh, we're gonna sing a little louder. Yeah. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. We're gonna sing a little louder. gonna sing a little louder and sing a little louder oh sing a little louder and sing a little louder and sing a little louder Sing a little louder, and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. And louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roaring up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated. The King is alive, and I'm gonna sing. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise, death is defeated, the King is alive. Cause I'll raise a hallelujah. And I'll raise a hallelujah. Come on, sing it out. And I'll raise a hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. God, you're worthy.
heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are
Hi, my name is Tim. 
and I just want to share my testimony with you this morning. Starting at a young age, I was 12 years old, I was taken away from my parents. They actually made me ward of the state. Um, not because of my parents, but because of me. I was just a, a very bad kid, I guess you can say. Um, so off and on throughout my childhood, from 12 all the way up to 16, I was in and out of boys' homes, detention centers, mental institutions, and even a rehab. There was a lot of people trying to pour into my life, trying to figure out what was wrong with this kid, me. And, uh, you know, I, I went through a lot of programs. I went through a lot of uh, things going, you know, growing up because of that. I missed out on a lot in my childhood, actually, uh, even being with my family. Um, one of the things I remember is off and on throughout that time, there was a lot of people that would tell me about Jesus, and I just didn't want to listen. So I was, I was still kind of doing my own thing at the time and just lost as a child. Uh, by the time I was 16, things got serious real fast and I was facing 32 years in prison on some very serious charges. So in jail, uh, facing this 32 year prison sentence, uh, there was a man that used to come in and tell me about Jesus. And because I was so alone and my parents didn't know what to do with me. They didn't visit me regularly. I've, I've already been awarded the, the state for a while, in and out of that, and so I was pretty alone sitting in the county jail. They actually had me separated. So I was on uh, the second floor away from all the other inmates in the jail, uh, and I began to look at my life in a way that I'd never seen before. Uh, so basically he told me about Jesus, and. Uh, you know, I just didn't listen. But I did let him come and talk to me because I was lonely. And one day the judge came in and uh, he actually came to my cell and he sat down on my bed next to me and he said, I just wanted to meet the kid uh, that was facing these serious charges. And he asked me a bunch of questions and I answered. And one of the last things he said to me, he goes, well, I just wanted to meet you uh, because I'm gonna have to make an example out of you. And he left. And so when he left, uh, I began to felt very, you know, I began to feel very scared. And I remember the day before the deputy sheriff uh, opening up a brand new box of decon rat poison, and he set it just down the hall from my cell. Uh, so I made a little string with a weight on it, and I pulled that to my cell. And I remember in that jail, they used to give us uh, two peanut butter sandwiches every day as a snack in between meals. And so I crushed up that rat poison and I put it on the sandwich, I wrote a suicide note, I ate it and I went to bed. I woke up the next day and I didn't even have a stomachache. And I cried out to God and I said, I can't even die correctly. And at that moment, I remembered all the things that this man that would come in and tell me about Jesus came back to my memory. And so I fell down on the jail cell floor and I began to weep. And, and I mean, I wept and I cried out to God and I asked God to come into my life. Uh, I basically said, you're going to have to breathe for me. You're going to have to talk for me, walk for me, think for me because I can't do it. This is what I do. I can get myself here. And so my life has never been the same. I still had to face the consequences of my actions. And so, like I said, at 16, uh, I ended up doing five years in the penitentiary. So when everybody else was in junior high and high school, uh, that's where I was at, and I was in the penitentiary. And I got out in 1999. I haven't been back to prison since. Uh, since then, I've went to college, I've had a good career, but there was still something missing in me, and so I left that career behind to pursue the ministry, the calling on my life, and that's what brought me to Freedom City Church. Since I've been at Freedom City Church, I've seen my wife get saved, I've seen her get baptized, uh, I've seen my family begin to have more restoration, but there was something that was missing all those years in my life, and that was fellowship with people that understood who I was and where I've been. And so when I come to Freedom City, I feel like I'm at home. I feel like I'm with family. I appreciate the leadership here. I appreciate all the pastors here that pour into our lives on a daily basis. And I just love the discipleship pathway, the recovery pathway, the outreach here at Freedom City Church. Powerful testimony. Let's give it up for Tim Hudnall one more time and, and Christy Hudnall.
So how's everybody doing tonight? Well, I, I, uh, those of you that don't know, my name is David Manning, and I'm, uh, th- I have the honor of uh, work- working as the recovery chaplain, is what they call me here at Freedom City Church, and it's an honor to, to be able to work in uh, the recovery community here at, the Freedom C- at Freedom City Church and with Straight Street and the Hope Homes and the Northside Recovery Community Center, Victory Mission, and the many other um, recovery homes that come here to Freedom City Church. Um, many of you guys have heard uh, a lot my story pre- many times, um, and um, I want to be able to. Um, so this this week we actually celebrated my si- uh, it was my sister's birthday yesterday. So this is my sister up here on the screen, and many of you guys have heard this story, but I wanted to share it today. So this is my sister Cassandra. Um, she actually passed away from a heroin overdose um, just over two years ago here in Springfield, Missouri at the John B. Hughes apartment. So this picture on the bottom down here was 2000, uh, her birthday, 2018. It was the, the last birthday that we celebrated with her. And then this other picture was um, of her coming to, so I didn't even know what recovery was until she got clean and sober. She was in drug court. Never even it was foreign concept to me, but then she shared recovery with me. And then she ended up coming to um, Ozark Correctional Center where I was locked up, and she actually brought my son Tristan um, to see me. For I, I had only seen him one time in ten years, and my sister brought him to see me. And then the top picture is just me and her. Me and her were partners in crime uh, for many years. For many years. Um, and I just wanted to uh, show that picture and mention her today. Her birthday was yesterday. She would have been 37 years old. But also, as I, I want to mention um, others that we've lost um, here at Freedom City Church. So it's not just been my sister. It's been, I could think of um, 10 people right now. We've done more funerals here at Freedom City Church than we have uh, weddings in the last five years. I was at OCC Sunday night with the uh, at the guys, me and Zach, and they actually um, they took a moment to do the Serenity Prayer, and I wanted to do that with you guys tonight. You guys all know the Serenity Prayer, right? So, in honor of those that we have lost, let's take a moment of silence by the uh, and follow it up with the Serenity Prayer. I'll lead you in it. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things, the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray real quick. Father God, I just thank you for this night, and I ask God that I give, I ask that the Holy Spirit uses me, even in preparation of this message, I'm like, Are you sure you want me to say those things, God? And I believe with all my heart today that that you don't want me to say them, God, but you want to say them through me tonight. So I thank you, God. Take control of me, God, and speak through me tonight. Speak your word and speak your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So when I was in prison... um, in 2015, I got locked up, to, uh, and, I, and I, uh, that was the last time. So I got locked up, and I cried out to God, and I asked him to forgive me of my sins. Man, deep, deep repentance, and man, God showed up in my life, and I began seeking him with all of my heart, mind, and soul. And I began reading the word for my first time in my life, and that's really what uh, transformed. And you can take that picture down and put up. Uh, The other slide. Uh, I began seeking the Lord with all of my heart. And I began digging in uh, the Word of God. And man, Proverbs was huge to me. I love Proverbs. And uh, he gave me a specific verse that really changed my life. And Zach could probably remember this. We always talked about this verse. It's Proverbs 8.13, if you'll put that up there real quick. And it, it, it changed my perspective. It says, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. 
pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. For a long time, I, I pondered on that, and I was like, wow, what does that mean, God? And when I look at this verse, I, I, I want to ask you guys two questions here today. What is the fear of the Lord? And does God hate evil? What is the fear of the Lord? And does God hate evil? The first thing I want to talk about tonight is the fear of the Lord. So let me ask you, what is the fear of the Lord and why do we need it? Why do we need the fear of the Lord in our lives? It says we should fear the Lord because he is the author and creator of heaven and earth, of all things and of all people. We know that God is holy. How many of us know that God is holy and that, that he is pure, perfect, and that sin separates us from him? So we must recognize that God, how many of us, we, we need to recognize that God is loving, he's merciful, he's forgiving, but he is also holy. He's just and he's righteous. Because he is these things, listen to this, because he is these things, he has no choice but to judge our sin. This alone, right, knowing this alone should cause us to have a fear of who he is. So knowing that he is God, the God of judgment, watch this, and that he will judge the entire human race should be enough for all of us to fear him. It should be so sobering, listen to this, it should be so sobering that God is, con listen to this, he is constantly aware of our actions and motives, both good and bad, that we, we will be held accountable for our actions, both now and on the personal day of judgment. So I'm going to make one more final point about the fear of the Lord, and it's probably one of my favorites uh, and most relatable, and it's what I mostly love about my Father in Heaven, our Father in Heaven, when it comes to uh, the fear of the Lord. But I like to think of it as this right here. The fear of dad, right? How many of us know about the fear of dad? So let me tell you about raising two twin three-year-olds and a teenager. When I correct or discipline them, it's different from the twins. And then uh, when, I, from when I correct the twins and then when I correct the teenager. And you guys all know what teenager I'm talking about. So... And I'm just going to tell you, I do have another kid, Daniel, but he's only one and a half, and he can't do no wrong yet, all right? So he's too little, and he's perfect, all right? So when I tell you the twin, when, listen to this, when I tell the twins not to do something, I get this response, no, right? No. And then I yell, right? Usually I yell, and my wife says, too loud and at an unnecessary level. Right, but it's because I'm flawed and not perfect, and I'm in the good dad's class, everybody. So, and then it's followed by a spanking or telling them not to do it. And then we also have a, a timeout chair. My wife has a timeout chair, but check out this uh, picture up here, and this pretty much sums up uh, what timeout looks like, everybody. That pretty much sums everything up you guys need to know, all right? But check this out. Look how he, he might look like this, but he also looks like this on a good day, so show him the other one. <laughs> with the teenager, you can put the regular slide back up. That's wood, everybody. So with the teenager, I usually get a response like, Why? with a really dumb look of how he just doesn't understand, right? Can you guys picture Tristan with the dumb look on his face? Okay. Now, then I get quiet, and he gets nervous, right? Then I usually yell and give a 30-minute lecture, and then there's some type of grounding. But watch this. In both cases, 
there is always a point after discipline and correction that they come back to dad as though they feel bad for their actions. <clears throat> and then there is nothing better, watch this, than a fear of dad, hug of repentance. They always come up and they want that hug afterwards. <clears throat> Listen to this. It's not that we want our kids to fear us, but it's that we want them to respect, respect us and honor us as their parents. It's the same with God. Our Heavenly Father and having a healthy fear of Him. We should all have a deep sense of respect and reverence for God and His right judgments. We should all want to obey His command and please Him as our Father. It's the same principle. And when we let Him down, watch this, we should always know that He is there to receive our hug of repentance. God is always there. All right, I have a second question for you tonight. Does God hate evil? For some of us, it might be hard to comprehend or understand how God could hate something and even evil. Some people have a hard time, right? Because they say, God doesn't hate. God is love. But look at this in Proverbs uh, 6, 16 through 19, what it says. It says, there are six things, actually, that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, liars. These are the things that God hates. And hands that shed innocent blood. And then really focus on this one. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. Yep, if you're sowing discord among your brethren, or among your sister in the church, God actually hates that. Right? So there are things, it says it right there, these are the things that God hates. And I believe there's some other things that God hates as well. And how many of us have heard the sin, uh, we've all heard this before, God hates the sin but loves the sinner. Let me share with you some, some evil things that God hate, hates that I want to talk to you about. Right Tonight I want to talk to you about the substances of evil. Now I'm going to give you some statistics. I love statistics. Um, it really puts into perspective for me. Um, so from 1999 to 2018... 750,000 people died of drug overdose. In 2019, 80,000 people died of drug overdose. In, 2000, in 2020, 93,000 people died of drug overdose. Now look at this. Bootleg versions of fentanyl, right? We're seeing it in our neighborhood made by drug cartels in Mexico with, with chemicals from China, right? And this is all according to the, uh, the, the DEA, right? The Drug Enforcement Administration. We know that this new fentanyl is devastating not only our community, but communities across the nation. Now, look at this. If, if you add up all those statistics, right, the U.S. recently reported this past Wednesday... Uh, the CDC reported that the highest number of drug overdose deaths in a 12-month period, right? So we were at, remember, 70,000, 80,000, 90,000. We see a 10,000 raise each year. Just this Wednesday, they reported, right, that from April 2020 to April 2021, over 100,000 lives were lost to the drug an opioid epidemic in the United States of America. On an average, one American dies from drug overdose every five minutes. And approximately, look at this, 280 people die every day in the U.S. from overdose. Now, if I, I'm not that great at math, but if I was to add up the 750,000 the 70,000, the 80,000, the 93,000, 
and the 100,000 over the last 20 years, it would be safe to say that one million lives have been lost to drug overdose in the last 20 years. Now, not to mention, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, I didn't really, but I'm going to hit you guys hard tonight because I, I want you guys to have, see, my, my goal when I do stuff like this and share this stuff with you is not to like make you feel bad or anything like that, but I believe that God is raising up men and women who are going to have a voice in the recovery community and in the church community, but sometimes we have to have pain inside of us and understand the pain Right to turn that pain into passion to be voices. Right for pe- men and women to rise up. We don't want people just sitting in the pews. We want men and women to rise up and use their recovery stories and their voices to make a change. How many of us believe that here today? So with a hundred, uh, with a million lives lost to overdose, I want you to picture this right here. How many kids? have been left behind as orphans because their mommy or daddy overdosed. Put that picture up of my sister real quick. So because my sister died overdose, right, and my son's mom, right, what we're seeing is kids left behind without their mommy and daddy because of the evil that comes with drug addiction, the evil that comes with these cartels and these chemical distributioners um, over in China, right? Right? We see an evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That's what the Lord's talking about. I have nothing for the, subs- for the substance of mind-altering drugs. I don't have nothing for it. Right? I got a grudge against the enemy, and I'm here to tell you about it today. Let me tell you something. God loves the drug addict, but he hates the drugs. And he wants to change the hearts of those, listen to this, who devise evil plans to destroy lives with drugs. Drug dealers, cartel members, drug addicts, chemical manufacturers. I believe that God has the power to change their hearts, right? And take their evil hearts, their hearts of stone, and turn it into flesh. How many of us believe that here today? Right? I'm looking for a church that's going to start praying that the trap house doors down the street get kicked in, the people get arrested, they get sent to Green County Jail, and they give their lives to the Lord laying on the floor in Green County. That's what I'm praying, right? Uh, that's what I'm praying for, because I know that's where... How many of us encountered God in prison or in jail, right? All right, let's pray the trap house doors shut. Board up the crack houses, right, and send them to Green County. Because I know that's a place where they're going to hear Pastor John's testimony. The second substance of evil. And it gets deeper and deeper, right? It's not just about drugs, let me tell you. It's not just about drugs. See, we get a lot of times we focus all of our attention on the opioids, right? But when we we should actually be have our focus on Anheuser Busch and Marlboro, right? So listen to this right here. An estimated ninety five thousand people approximately 68,000 men and 27,000 women die from alcohol-related causes every year. Oh, it's okay, though. It's, a, it's legal, right? You can go down to the store and buy it, but it's okay that all these lives were lost, right? In 2019, appro- listen to this, approximately 15 million people ages 12 and older had an alcohol use disorder. 15 million people, and that's just an alcohol use disorder. So we know all the dysfunction that comes with that. See, my experience with alcohol when I was um, five, six years old, I remember my mom was a severe alcoholic. She would drop me and my four brothers and sisters off at the park while she uh, went to the bar with her boyfriend, right? And they'd they'd drink beer and snort cocaine. And my older sister, who's watching right now... (coughs) would have to literally watch her, uh, all of her brothers and sisters while her mom was at the uh, uh, bar. And then my mom wouldn't come back for hours sometimes. And uh, my sister would have to knock on a stranger's door and we'd have to use a phone and try. That's what alcohol did in my early years. 
my teenage years, starting at 13, 14, devastated. I was I drank vodka every day for several years. Me and my sisters, uh, my house was the party house. It was consumed by alcoholism. What about how many of us heard the story the other day of the guy up here at Glenstone and Battlefield at the GameStop? Right? In the reports, it says that he seemed intoxicated and that he was armed with a gun, right? And he was so intoxicated that he must have pulled a gun on him. He shot at the cops, and they had to uh, shoot and kill him and put him down, right? Because of alcoholism. Now, I'm convinced that's what it was. He was too drunk to know what was going on, had a gun, pulled it out, and lost his life. How many of us here today understand that alcohol destroys families, takes lives, and is ultimately an evil substance? How many of us believe that here today? I have nothing for the substance of alcohol and the pain and loss that is brought to the people for, to people for centuries. I have nothing for it. Right? So when they say, oh, it's, it's okay to, to drink, it's legal, right? And I'm not, the reason I don't drink is because I understand the evil forces behind it, right? So you can uh, rationalize it all you want, but if you want, we can talk about it, and I'll give you some more statistics and stories of moms and dads and uncles and brothers and sisters that lost their lives and are doing life in prison or, or uh, drove off the road, committed a DWI, and killed somebody, how many of us here today can relate to what I'm talking about with alcohol? I'm sure everybody here has been impacted in some way, but watch this. God loves the alcoholic, but hates the alcohol. The last one I want to talk about, and I, I, I you know, I, God spoke to me and told me to share this because it was really on my heart. And God, he, God even told me he's going to do something with it here tonight. So I'm warning you guys, uh, cigarettes and tobacco are responsible, watch this, for more than 480,000 deaths per year in the United States. Cigarette smoking remains the leading cause of preventable disease and death in the United States. Cigarettes... Listen to this. Cigarettes are the leading cause of death in the United States, but watch this, but one of the most socially acceptable forms of evil. Watching my, bro uh, my mother, right? I had, had to sit back and watch her. My mother die of cancer, right? She ended up dying of stage four lung and brain cancer from years of alcoholism and smoking. She was never able to see me turn my life around or meet my wife and my kids. I laid down tobacco at the altar while I was in Ozark Correctional Center when I found out that my mom had cancer. And I'm going to give everybody the opportunity, because I know some people smoke and have alcohol, uh, tobacco, and I'm going to give you the opportunity as we go into worship at the end of this to lay it down once and for all tonight. Who can relate to losing family members and friends to tobacco-related cancer in the house tonight? Look at all them hands go up. How many... So hearing stories of moms and dads battling tobacco-related cancers, right? My wife does chemotherapy, and she actually uh, told me a story, man, and even showed me a picture of a mom saying goodbye to her two children... Right? Because she died of cancer and they were, and, and you know, kids every day having to say goodbye to their mom, whether it's related to tobacco or not, but nine times out of ten we know that cancer is directly um, related to, to uh, tobacco, alcohol, drugs. Right? We can't deny that. See, um, thinking of teenage kids, how about this one? Uh, t uh, when I think, because you guys all know this, right? All the kids are vaping and smoking in the bathroom. They can vape right there in the bathrooms at the high schools and in the middle schools, right? When you think of that, these teenagers smoking cigarettes, right? And I was puffing at uh, 12, 13 years old thinking I was cool. How, does that set well with you? Your kids sitting around smoking? It doesn't really set well with me. I don't know about you. So watch this. How many of us cherish 
the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and know that when we give our lives to Jesus, he comes and lives within us. How many of us believe that here today? All right, well, check this out. Those of you that are still in bondage to smoking, think of that the next time you take a hit because you're choking out the Holy Spirit. Every time you take a hit of that cigarette, you breathe it in, but you, and you're a believer, remember that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. Let me tell you something. I have nothing for the substance of cigarettes or smoking, but I'll remind you this. God loves the smoker, but I guarantee you this. He hates the cigarettes, and he hates the tobacco. Worship team, if you'll come up here at this time. See, my intentions here today are not to judge, offend, or be too harsh on anyone here tonight about smoking, drinking, or using drugs. That's not my intentions at all. My intention is to allow the Holy Spirit to work through me to give you a healthy fear of the Lord. And to know that God is saying when, it, when he makes a statement like he hates evil... He hates the evil that generates sin. Listen to this. God hates the evil that generates the sin that ultimately separates us from him. That's what it's all about. He just wants to be close to his children. That's why he hates the evil, because the evil generates the sin that separates him from his children. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. God wants to open your eyes to the spiritual realm of evil tonight. I believe that in the next minutes, God is going to begin to open eyes, open ears, and open hearts. Right? That the alcohol, tobacco companies, pharmaceutical companies, drug cartels, right, are being controlled by spiritual forces of evil. Something bigger than you could ever even imagine, right, is actually behind that and listen to this it's the sin inside of those who are being controlled listen to this by greed pride hatred the love of money and many other things that are used to control those who are under the power of Satan see one thing when we give our lives to Jesus we're able to see through the eyes of Jesus and understand spiritual warfare and what's actually behind evil right how many of us know that it says in Ephesians 6, 12, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and the cosmic powers over the, the present darkness? And then look at that, what it says. Against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Evil is when you, in, listen to this, evil is when you influence and lead others astray. Listen to this. Leading others into addiction, selling drugs, poisoning the community, right? How many of us have been guilty of that, right? I, I spent many of my years of my life influencing people with drugs, alcohol, using the needle for the first time. Many of them people aren't here today. They're dead, right? But I want God to, to change my heart. Right? Change my heart and turn it so that I can bring life to people instead of death. How many of us want God to use us like that? See, evil is when you are consumed by the desire to have power and money that you do not care about anyone except your own agenda. How many of us know that that's somebody we never want to be again? Because a lot of us have been there, but that's somebody I never want to be again. And I believe that that's what God wants to do here tonight in these last moments. Because I know I got some people's attention. If anyone that does not know him, uh, he wants to give you that healthy fear of the Lord tonight. Right? How many of us are thankful for the fear? It also says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? And wisdom is actually the ability to see, right? Like, let's say we're, we're going to go to make a choice, and it's going to be the wrong choice, but we can have wisdom, right, before we make that choice so that we don't make the wrong choice and ultimately sin, and sin separates us from God, right? That's why God gives us that healthy 
fear of the Lord so he can prevent. It's actually for our safety, right? It's actually so that he can keep his children closer to him. He wants to give you a healthy fear of the Lord because he loves you and because you are his son or daughter. God wants you to be able to recognize evil so that you can be protected from sin because sin separates you from God. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be harsh on you or anything like that. Man, I, uh, when, if, if you're in bondage from an addiction, alcoholism, cigarettes, whatever it is, man, you're children of God. God wants you to lay those things down here tonight. God wants to heal you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to set you free. Right? It's, it's, it's not that he, God loves you. He just hates the sin. Right? And whatever it is, how many of us, let me say this, how many of us want to be as close to God as we possibly can? So if there's anything that's um, in between you and God here tonight, God wants you to bring it to this altar and lay it down once and for all. He wants you to lay those things down at the altar and leave them there and never pick them up again. So we like to give everybody an opportunity to respond to the grace of God here at the church. So let's just take a minute to bow our heads and let's just get in a place where it's just you and God. It's all about just you and God. And those of you, um, the elders of the church, the leaders, begin to pray because God wants to use this moment, right, to touch hearts. He wants to give a, an opportunity to everyone here to surrender their lives to Jesus once and for all. It says in Romans that we all fall short of the glory of God. I still fall short of the glory of God. And in preparation of this message and up here right now, I can think of one, two, three, four, several things that I struggle with that is separating me from God that when I'm done speaking tonight, I'm going to jump down off of this altar and I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to lay them down because I want to be closer to God. It says, for the wages of sin is death. But then it says, but God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And then it says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So I don't know how everybody came in here tonight. But God wants your attention. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus... He wants you to do it tonight, once and for all. Tonight's the night. If you've never given your life to Jesus, maybe you've never heard the gospel message that I'm preaching. Maybe God's speaking to you, and you can sense the fear of the Lord, and you know that you're not living right. And tonight's the night that you want to give your life to Jesus once and for all. Two, maybe you were once walking with the Lord. Or maybe I'm talking about something. You feel like you're not right with God tonight, and you need to get right with him that there's some type of sin in your life and you want to lay it down once and for all and you want to recommit your life to the Lord and you want to start walking this thing out. If that's you, I'm going to count to three and then you can just you can just raise your hand where you're sitting, okay? So one, you've never heard the gospel message. You've never given your life to Jesus and you want to give your life to Jesus tonight. Two, there's some sin in your life. There's something you want to lay down tonight. You're going to lay it down at the altar. You're going to come up here bold. And you're never going to pick it up again. Three, just raise your hand right now if that's you. I see those hands going up. Get up and come up here then. We're going to give you an opportunity. Come up here. We're going to pray with you. Says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I believe that God's raising up men and women who know what it means to have the fear of the Lord in their life. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray this prayer real quick. Just look up at me. Let's do. Let's pray this prayer, and then um, and then after that we're just going to open up the altars. And if there's something else anybody else wants to come up here and lay down tonight, tonight. So. Just repeat this prayer after me as you guys are looking at me. Say, Dear Jesus, 
Say, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Everybody in the house say, my sins. And say, I believe that on the third day, you rose from the dead. Say, fill me with your spirit, God. Say, I lay this down today. Say, today I will make you Lord of my life. And my new life starts today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, if you guys that came up here, let's go ahead and um, have you guys go in the back room with Tim Hudnall right here. He's going to get you guys to fill out, um, to get your information. He wants to be able to connect with you. But as before we go into worship, praise God. You guys, let's give it up for these guys who are bold. As we go into worship tonight, we're going to open up these altars. And even if it's not cigarettes, maybe it's that you're dealing with depression or anxiety, right? But you know there's something that you're struggling with. We open these altars tonight as we go into worship and just lay those things down. Leave them at the foot of the cross tonight and never pick them up again. God bless you all and we'll see you later. We'll be up here um, offering prayer for everybody. And if the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire. The refiner, and I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, he is my life. If your glory wants to come in, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place and set it ablaze. And I'll be a living.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we get tonight to come into your house and praise you. Lord, you're worthy of all our praise. God, you're more than enough for us. Heavenly Father, as we heard tonight, Lord, I pray that, Lord, this would not be something that we just keep in this room, God, but when we leave, Lord, that we would take that with us, Father. Jesus, we give all we have to you tonight. Lord, it's all yours. God, I pray a blessing over the people in this room tonight, God, and I pray that your hand would be upon them as they go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. My team bring the heat like the Saudis. Living the South with my family from Cali. And shout out to Bay, we don't live in the valley. No. Hey, yo, this is a worldwide premiere. Somebody get me two throwback jerseys, two Nike headbands, and a pair of white forces. Indie tribe save lives. And make sure when you spell that name, it's all lowercase yeah. with a period. Really came in the game of fortune and fame. And said I didn't want it, they doubted, they doubted. I found a team, we made our own lane. And now they all say that we bout it, we bout it. We got more rings than Audis, I'm outie. My team bring the heat like the Saudis. Live in the South with my family from Cali. And shout out to Bay, we don't live in the valley. No, my whole crew look like it's hella cold. Or maybe a panda, you got it, bro. You say I'm prideful and wildin'. No, I just won't bury my talent, bro. Might be conceited, I give it to Jesus. He told me to drink from his chalice. Told him I'll be more mature and won't sin anymore. And he told me I should be more childish. Whoa, yeah. Look, my demons looking depressed Must have been something I said Any try, baby, you know the name of my set I got it out of the mud I'm from the sticks Hunting is just in my blood And I changed my last name to FUD I'm from the six One five like in a dozen Two <laughs> I told y'all what it is, man Y'all not ready for this Let's take it to the east side of Atlanta Hey, Billy Better things trying to go silly If you can't see, make them feel it You don't think we gon' win, oh, really Let me say something right quick, boy we ain't playing with you, I ain't no toy. Trying to get a whole family employed. Boy, you better start working. Then we throwing nothing east side, you ain't been in that. It's a lot of cap going on, nothing in that. Keep be a dog running around where you women at. Who's at the bottom looking up and I remember that. Then we trying to come and take the plate, we ain't finish it. Got the Wi Fi, we ain't paying no in that. Feeling like MJ, wait, where well, Pippin at? Man, never mind, never mind my business. Shades on my face with a beat laid on me. Couple more years, I'ma be big homie. Gotta thank God for the folks that know me. Till little man on the way to Wyoming. Been the same one, ain't nothing been phony. Working all night, trying to get a little more.
Here's what we're not going to do if we in love. And my phone gonna trust my baby lately. You'll be loving me. Oh, no, no. tried taking him into youth groups and stuff, but he was interested in rap, 